Welcome to Intelligent Automation Radio, the number one podcast for IT executives seeking insights on the impact and opportunities for innovation that automation is delivering to businesses around the world. Featuring thought leaders in AI, machine learning, orchestration, security automation, and the future of work. And now, on with the show. Welcome, everyone. My name is Guy Nadidi, and I'm the host of Intelligent Automation Radio. Our guest on today's episode is Brett Greenstein, Vice President and Global Head of Artificial Intelligence for Cognizant Technology Solutions, a global MSP with 270,000 employees worldwide. Prior to Cognizant, Brett spent over 30 years with IBM, where he led their Watson Internet of Things offerings. And with a pedigree like that, and given his deep domain expertise in the fields this podcast focuses on, we absolutely had to have Brett on the show, and he was gracious enough to take time out from his very busy schedule to join us today. Brett, welcome to Intelligent Automation Radio. Thank you very much, Guy. It's a pleasure to be here. Brett, you've spent most of your career with IBM, and -hmm. then you left Big Blue to join Cognizant Technology Solutions. And Cognizant, while being a large global firm with uh, over a quarter million employees, probably isn't one of the first companies that comes to mind when you think of AI. Uh, Nevertheless, Cognizant uh, is taking an interesting approach to AI by applying Darwinian principles to its machine learning efforts with what it calls evolutionary AI. Now, there are currently three basic machine learning paradigms, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. What are the main principles behind evolutionary AI, and do you think it might become the fourth paradigm of machine learning? I do. Um, You can think of this as a natural extension of deep learning and reinforcement uh, learning as well. Um, You can think of it as an extension of that. The key principles are that we're able to build models, even even from almost no data, um, bootstrapping a model itself, letting AI learn from whatever limited rules or limited data you have to begin to create a surrogate of your business, and then to use the surrogate uh, to explore possible solutions and then improve the model. So this evolutionary technique, uh, genetic algorithms, allow us to take a model that might be reasonably crude at first, and then refine the model and improve it over time, and then to use simulations with the model to create um, optimal decisions. And you'll find that most uh, learning techniques usually find strong local optimal decisions, Um, or they can exhaustively search an entire space uh, for possible solutions, but it can take an almost infinite amount of time depending on the complexity of the space. We use an approach that allows us to do uh, population-based learning. So as we're exploring the solution space, using our surrogate models, all of the simulation, Um, We can explore every possible um, opportunity in parallel. And then the population learning allows us to learn from every exploration, stopping ones that are inefficient or or suboptimal uh, and putting our focus on ones that are more optimal. uh, If I could, just for a second more, the result of that is we can often learn with less data and significantly faster time uh, to get to the same, you know, optimal outcomes. Mm -hmm. better. Interesting. Now, There's been a lot of hype around AI the past few years and uh, in some quarters, even fear. Mm -hmm. And when I read about the accelerating developments taking place in the field, it reminds me of what the uh, economist Rudiger Dornbusch once said about economics, where things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, what do you see as some long promised AI capabilities that will be happening faster now than we thought they could? So you're right, it's a combination of them. We've all been watching this space for our entire careers, always one day away from the big breakthrough, but it is accelerating. And it's accelerating because we're finding that instead of AI being generally intelligent and replacing you know, all of us as, as leaders in whatever we do, it's actually extremely specialized intelligence. And it's in those specializations that it's moving very, very fast. There was only a few years ago where the idea of uh, machine vision could recognize you know, a dog or a cat or hot dog or not a hot dog, you know, these kinds of, of very simplistic cases. And now um, it's already generally recognized that um, image recognition can provide better diagnostics of x-rays and radiology uh, than human beings, more accurate. Um, it doesn't replace it, 
what it does is gives the radiologist new tools to find things they might have missed or to validate things they assumed um, or, or, or figured out themselves. So in many ways, the specialization of AI has progressed much faster than I think everyone thought. Look at conversational AI. Um, we all saw you know, Alexa and Google come out and we're like kind of impressed that you can talk to a computer. That's been a promise for decades, but you can already see the advancements with, with uh, Google Duplex, for example, where the language is so natural um, that it you know, can't be discerned from speaking to a person, which is now requiring um, solutions to identify themselves as AI when you're talking to them. Who would have ever thought in all that discussion about Turing machines that we would actually have to have systems tell you it's an AI so you wouldn't confuse it with a person? But that's where we're at now. Okay, now <clears throat> those are some interesting use cases. So I want to go back for a moment to Cognizance Evolutionary mm -hmm. AI Initiative. Can you speak about some of the more interesting use cases your team has applied evolutionary AI to and the results you achieved? Of course. So let me, before I do that, let me just back up on, on really your opening. When you think of AI, AI has its technology foundation layers, what the APIs and services for natural language processing or, or um, image recognition or other um, specific cases available through all the cloud providers, um, along with the tools to build up, you know, uh, an AI-based system and, and feed it with you know, data that's needed. These are generally provided through uh, cloud services and cloud providers, and the advancements in those are accelerating every day. It's amazing leapfrog uh, movement uh, in technology. Then you've got companies like ours which apply AI to business problems. So we take the technologies available there, we apply our own IP, use cases, industry knowledge, and then deliver outcomes. So that's what makes us unique um, in, the, in the space of AI is that we have IP like evolutionary AI, we work with the technologies from the cloud providers and, and application providers, and then we build new business processes and transform processes using AI. So in that light, we're using AI, evolutionary AI sp specifically in two areas. One is for people who've been built deep learning models, neural networks for any, of any type, um, they're generally been built by people, architected by people, optimized by people which means you're constrained by the number of data scientists, PhDs you have to work on a problem. We can take evolutionary AI and optimize and improve the architecture of models of neural nets to make significantly more accurate outcomes. So we've been using that in conversational AI, in image recognition, in, um, in, in other forms of machine learning patterns to build significantly better optimized models off of whatever people built manually. So we're gonna take the work of data scientists and improve it. This helps them be more productive um, and to deliver higher accuracy. The other thing we're doing with it is we're using evolutionary AI to find optimal outcomes. So in a business process, if you're trying to decide um, how to price things or where to put things on shelves or how to staff your, your, your business, and you have different goals of revenue and profit and customer retention and loyalty, we can take all those parameters and all those goals and use evolutionary AI to find optimal outcomes, which are sometimes counterintuitive outcomes, um, which are a, a way for people to take it to the next level. A lot of AI is, is really good at predictive analytics. We're using this to be prescriptive, to help business decision makers know what to do to get the very best possible outcome. So with the idea of prescriptive AI in mind, right? what do you think are gonna be some of the biggest disruptions we'll see in three, five, or 10 years from now with respect to automation, AI, and machine learning? I think it's gonna be the access uh, uh, of AI to business decision makers on a broad scale. While the technologies themselves will get faster, we're gonna see continued improvements in uh, performance uh, in cloud based on uh, GPU and CPU performance and, and virtualization capabilities. You're gonna see significantly better performance for you know, raw um, execution of models. But the faster pace, and, and of course, you're going to see improvements in data science and the tools to accelerate uh, the creation of models, the pipelining of data, um, the scaling out of AI services. But we're going to move from an era where a small number of people, data scientists, data engineers, other experts, are creating AI to 10 or 100 times or 1,000 times more people who will be using AI, using AI to make real business decisions every day. So... Um, we worked with quite a few analysts and they consistently predict, you know, more than 100% growth 
um, every year of the number of projects each client is working on in AI. And that's because it starts out as one project and then you realize I can apply this more generally and it gets broader and broader. Um, but you're also seeing it more accessible. So today it's still a lot of work to build, um, going back to that retail example, a store optimization engine you know, using evolutionary AI. There's still a fair amount of work involved in that. But these things will be packaged up and become more repeatable, at which point any store manager anywhere should have access to this, being able to feed it the data, their historic data, their supply data, their, their staffing and resource and cost data, and get, you know, and local data and get optimal models. So I think in the next few years, we're going to see um, AI being useful by business leaders the way that spreadsheets became useful. It's just going to happen significantly faster. And so with that growing ubiquity, uh, mm -hmm. whenever we have an AI expert like yourself on the show, I always like to ask them the following question. Over the long term, do you think that AI and machine learning will ultimately augment more people or replace more people? So it's, I think it's going to create more jobs because it creates more value. And as long as human beings are, are run businesses and create value in market, which means grow the economy, it creates more opportunity new jobs, new style of jobs. Now, there's definitely going to be individual jobs which will be able to be done by AI, some augmented by AI, um, and some that can't be replaced. And so I think for individuals, looking at constant education is really important. We built a data science academy within Cognizant so that all of our employees have access to training and skills so they can continue to learn new skills and grow um, as, as AI becomes a part of how we all do our jobs. So. I think a lot of companies are going to have to consider how they do you know, continuous education of their workforce as they embrace AI. It also creates all kinds of new jobs. There was never a time, you know, long ago where you had people um, cleaning up data to the degree we're going to be, you know, managing data, it's integrity, cleaning it up, um, bringing new insights, creating data marketplaces. This is all new stuff. Um, as we move from data warehouses to data lakes and modern data architectures, this is all because of AI. And then the roles in AI, um, for example, we have conversational designers in our AI team. That's a, that was not a career anyone could choose in college. That didn't exist a few years ago. But now we have people who design amazing customer experiences using conversational AI, and they're like the webmasters of natural language. And it brings all kinds of new design skills and social and, and psychological skills in building great user experience and doing it with conversation. Okay, now you just spoke a lot about the data driving AI and machine learning, but the underlying models AI solutions are based on are built upon algorithms. And late last year, uh, Harvard Business School published an article calling for the auditing of algorithms the same way companies are required to issue audited financial statements, public companies anyways. Mm -hmm. Given that AI developers can incorporate their own biases into algorithms, even unintentional, unintentionally or unconsciously, mm -hmm. what do you think about the need for algorithm auditing? So I think it's, it's a little more um, subtle uh, than what you describe, and that is when people do you know, auditing of anything, they audit results. They don't always audit, audit, you know, audit the algorithms, although they can. I think in the case of AI, um, you're looking at systems where you, you, I don't think you should be looking at neural network designs to figure out is it fair or not. But I think you should be accountable for the output generated and whether it's providing um, biased outputs and biased results. There's already technologies, which some we've built, some, um, some of the cloud providers have built, that are for bias detection and remediation, where you can compare the output of an algorithm to the expected distribution and assess whether it's, it's created some inherent bias. There's also more subtle forms of bias that can be incorporated that are harder to detect. Um, but I don't think this is something where you crawl through the code or crawl through the algorithm the same way um, you might think. I think this is one where you have to look more at the output and the behavior of systems rather than the code itself. The, the algorithm, the data that feeds it, the uh, fine tuning of parameters, all can influence uh, the bias of an overall system. The same way that human beings can be inherently biased. You know, you can hire someone who seems brilliant, great resume, and they're your recruiter for you, and they just have a bias you couldn't see. You'll know it if you look at their output. Uh, but you wouldn't know it if you tried to inspect the brain. So inspecting the brain of an AI is probably not the best approach, um, but looking at the output, 
um, understanding how it's, the system is behaving, uh, having testing criteria and design and, and principles around how you manage it and govern it over time is probably the best way for us to, uh, to recognize and reduce bias. In addition, introducing uh, diversity among the people who create systems, also looking at the timeframes of data. Um, a lot of times uh, people are training systems on very old data, which is itself inherently biased because people were more biased you know, years ago. And so you have to really look at a few of these principles when you're designing systems to make sure you're, you're looking at it with fresh eyes. Mm, interesting perspective. There's a lot of excitement, Brett, about AI for young people entering the workforce and even for more established professionals thinking about a career change. I'm curious, what kinds of skills does Cognizant covet the most when hiring talent for automation, AI, and machine learning? So there's the core skills around the ability to create um, algorithms and models and to operate um, businesses using AI, as well as the data engineering uh, in order to make data uh, available in the forms needed uh, for AI. So those skills are all extremely hot. Those are the creators. Um, but increasingly, we're looking for people who are AI aware with a business point of view, because ultimately we're transforming business processes, call centers, supply chains, retail store operations, diagnostics for in, in healthcare, um, insurance underwriting, reconciliation and banking. Those are not data science skills. They require data science, but they also require subject matter and domain expertise in those processes. So I'm very excited to start to see um, universities and online uh, education and graduate degrees beginning to be aimed at I'll call it um, AI awareness, AI um, uh, understanding for business people, not just for technologists. And so as you become, as we become algorithmic thinkers, people who can recognize the value and the use of algorithms and data uh, for your business, that skill is going to become extremely important. Uh, and I don't think most companies should delegate you know, their AI transformation to data scientists or technologists it's really going to come down to business leaders who understand the value of this and how it works and what it means. Uh, I'll give you a metaphor. The, um, when the internet came out, most CMOs knew they had to do something. So they took their catalog and they stuck it on the web and they called it a day. And those companies are mostly out of business. There were other people, uh, webmasters, HTML geeks and others who recognized that the web could be the front end of business. And they created, you know, companies like Amazon and others, that, um, that wouldn't have existed otherwise. And so those people saw the web for what it was, which is a, a form of interaction, information sharing and engagement, and they transform business around it. So we need people who see business in terms of the data that make up the business and what algorithms could do with it. Those people will transform every business process. So there are concerns cropping up about the misuse of AI and machine learning. And I'm curious, Brett, if you see any economic, legal, or political headwinds that could slow adoption of these advanced technologies? Or is the genie out of the bottle at this point to an extent that they just can't be stopped and perhaps not even effectively regulated? You know, there are really strong lessons to learn from the past on this. And I think the idea of saying the genie's out of the bottle, it can't be, can't be stopped, is, um, is irresponsible. And a lot of that happened in the web. Um, and it led to companies... Um, taking advantage of or abusing uh, public trust on the web, which led to privacy and other implications, and now a lot of backlash. I think all of us need to learn uh, from how technology can get ahead of policy and, and good judgment. And I think we're already seeing that in, in terms of AI, where there's significantly more talk around data privacy on um, ethical and responsible AI. And a lot of talk at the government level. Uh, we've been involved with the World, World Economic Forum, for example, um, as well as uh, recently speaking, at, I spoke at a, a conference for Politico uh, specifically around responsible and ethical AI um, and its implication on the workforce. I think it's getting discussed because I think we're all smarter than we were. And I think we recognize collectively that this is not something you just unleash and see what happens. Um, these are specialized skills and capabilities. They transform business. There's implications to it. And, um, you know, we have to go you know, head in recognizing this needs to be regulated. It needs to be managed. Um, companies need to be responsible in how they manage it. We have a, for example, a council for responsible AI at Cognizant, specifically to make sure we have cross-functional leadership looking at the projects we do, the projects we don't do, and then we're thinking about how we use it to help and support our brand. 
And if there's anything to be learned from, you know, recent history, it's that brands rely on how um, they're, they're perceived by the public. The use of AI can enhance your brand or hurt it, just like the use of any other technology. And so um, we've been spending a lot of time with clients discussing that and helping them to see their way through it. Overall, Brett, given your high level perspective, mm -hmm. what makes you most optimistic about AI and machine learning? I think the people who work on it um, are so much less um, hype than the marketing. The people who actually do the work are very grounded in what it's good at and what it's not. You'll often hear media or other people talk about, you know, general intelligence and robot apocalypse and all that stuff. And that's fun to talk about because it's, you know, it's pop culture kind of stuff. But when you get down to it and talk to real, um, you know, data scientists, they're not worried about that. They're focused on accuracy of algorithms, improving data, um, getting more forms of data to work with, um, how they build ecosystems of, of insights, uh, obviously regulations. They're thinking in very grounded terms. And I think business leaders um, are embracing this. I haven't met a business yet who doesn't have some degree of investment. And they're all trying to figure out how do they responsibly get into this? How do they do projects that deliver business outcomes, not just experiment? Um, and that feels very different to me than the dot-com bubbles and hype that came around from everyone must be on the web. I don't think people generally believe everyone must use AI. They, they're trying to figure out where it applies, where it delivers value, and they're focused on that. So we don't get asked to do a lot of frivolous projects. We get asked to do things that deliver real outcomes. And I think projects grounded in outcomes are going to be the way that you know, all companies uh, embrace this responsibly. Brett, for the CIOs, CTOs, and other IT executives listening in, what is the one big must-have piece of advice you'd like them to take away from our discussion with regards to deploying AI and machine learning at their organizations? Mm -hmm. uh, while data is something that's important to be managed, um, almost all the customers of IT have told us they need access to data. And not just the data that runs the business, but all the data about the customer's supply chain, environments they operate in. So you know, local data, geospatial data, social data, IoT data, all the other stuff that CIOs may not have had to manage historically are now relevant to AI-based systems for business. And so embrace the fact that data accessibility and the forms of data is going to be, you know, a never-ending agenda for you now. And we can't just manage it and protect it. We've got to really unlock it um, in, in ways that reach uh, the business leads and then they, the business leaders themselves are going to continue to ask for more, um, more help on data science, more help on governance, more help on access to data. Um, and this is part of the, the new normal. Um, I don't think it can be controlled under one person. I have not seen that pattern happen very often. It seems to be pockets all over companies, and we have to figure out ways to help them, govern them, steer them, enable them um, without limiting them. I think that's going to be a real eye opener for a lot of the CIOs and CTOs listening in. I, I think so. I, I, if I could just for a second more, so many CIOs are transitioning and pivoting to this already. So they're driving agendas for data modernization, creating a, a much more modern architecture for access to data across their enterprise. And so that's being driven from CIOs as well as chief data officers, which are sometimes in the CIO office. I think that's great. I think it shows the connectedness between the CIO and some of the business buyers who are driving an AI agenda. Um, that kind of teaming moves IT from being a cost to an enabler of you know, revenue and growth. And I think that's probably the best thing that could happen to, to the world of IT. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for on this episode of Intelligent Automation Radio. Brett, it's always great interviewing someone with the kind of deep domain expertise you possess because that usually means we're going to learn something intriguing. And um, you definitely didn't disappoint today. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been great having you on. Thank you so much, Guy. It's a pleasure for myself as well. Brett Greenstein, Vice President and Global Head of Artificial Intelligence for Cognizant Technology Solutions. Thank you for listening, everyone. And remember, don't hesitate. Automate. Thank you so much for listening today. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. We publish new shows regularly, and you won't want to miss one. And please remember to give us a rating. It helps others find the show. Intelligent Automation Radio is sponsored by IEHU, 
the leader in intelligent automation solutions for IT and cybersecurity. You can get more information about Ayehu by visiting our website at ayehu.com. That's A-Y-E-H-U.com. Ayehu, creating the successful path to the self-driving enterprise.